their detainment. Officials in Iran have confirmed it. What action is the Secretary of State, along with colleagues in the Foreign Office, going to take to resolve this shameful situation with urgency? Uh, the, the Honourable Member will know that I held a debate at the backbencher in this House about that very debt and the need and determination to repay it as a... Uh, stain on Britain's honour from when we dealt with it in the 1970s. Uh, that is uh, definitely the intention that we comply with any court orders that are made against us. We continue to do so, but we have to make sure that whatever we do is within line with both this law and the sanctions law that we have to observe as well. Mark Menzies. Mark. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. The BA Systems site at Walton and White constituency employs over 6,000 people, serving as a source of high-skilled employment and plays a critical role in UK defence capability. With Team Tempest project reaching its critical phase, does my right honourable friend agree that this project must be at the heart of the government's defence plans and must be provided with the backing it needs to give it certainty for the future? Mr. Mr. Speaker, Wharton plays a key role in the UK's combat air sector, and Tempest is the future of that sector, with over 1,800 highly skilled engineers and programmers already involved, going up to 2,500 next year. As the PM has made clear, this government is committed to invest in the future of our, of our combat air strategy. Catherine McKinnell. Catherine. Northeast sends a higher proportion of people into the armed forces than any other region, but also has historically high levels of unemployment. Service charities are concerned that the scope of the armed forces bill is too narrow and doesn't contain specific challenges like employment. And given the challenges facing transition from service to civilian life, will the government commit to ensuring all areas of potential disadvantage are addressed for North East veterans? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Armed Forces Bill is an important opportunity to enshrine the Armed Forces Covenant into law. I understand for some it goes too far and for some it doesn't go far enough. I would say to my honourable friend, it is the start of the process, it's the start of a conversation to make sure that the experience of being a veteran is levelled up across this country uh, and I look forward to working with her in the years ahead. James Gray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the hundred or so families in my, at Lynham in my constituency who are facing eviction from Anglican homes will very much welcome the Minister's remark a moment ago that he is to extend the eviction notice period until next March, and also they will be glad that, he is, uh, that they are to uh, enter into negotiations with the World Council about it. But is the Minister aware of one further complication, which is that those homes get their utilities from within the base, and Anglican homes are so far saying that will pre preclude them from being sold. Will he instruct uh, officials now to look into whether, what, what can be done about that particular circumstance? Uh, Mr Speaker, I hope we may have found a technical solution which would enable base dependent sites to be dealt with to allow sale to social housing providers if the parties agree. Our advice is that the transfer of supply can generally be effected relatively rapidly. We are willing to share this advice with Annington, who will need to be satisfied that they can perform connections to mains networks safely and efficiently with tenants in situ. Julian Lewis. It should be possible to restore the pensions of a small cohort of war widows who lost them on remarriage or cohabitation without setting a precedent that would open the floodgates in other respects for other cohorts. So what progress is the department making in addressing this debt of honour? Uh, I would say to my honourable friend that I am aligned with his views. The Secretary of State has worked tirelessly on this issue to try and correct this historic injustice uh, of uh, war widows' pensions. We will arrive at a solution uh, and we continue to examine all possibilities, including the ex gratia scheme and all the other uh, ideas my honourable friend has come up with in his tireless campaigning. Uh, like I said, the Secretary of State is committed to resolving this uh, and we will get there in the end. Kevin John's final question. Thank you, um, Speaker. The uh, government maintain that uh, every F-35 which is built has 15% UK content. But I understand that the MOD's uh, definition of content includes work carried out by UK companies by US uh, subsidiaries. So therefore, can I ask the Minister to publish uh, how he defines UK content in this programme, particularly so we can decide what is actually done in the UK and what is done in the US? I, I've, received, I've received a large number of parliamentary questions from the Honourable Gentleman, which I believe I've answered that question as part of them. Uh, if not, I will make certain that it is, it is clear to him, but with his 15% by value, we're very proud of the contributions being made by UK manufacturing to the F-35. Uh, but I, I will make certain that that is covered again. Point of order, Secretary of State. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On a point of order, uh, the ministerial code is clear, and I quote, when Parliament is in session, the most important announcements of government policy should be made first in the first instance in Parliament. I know, Mr. Speaker, this is a principle that you believe is fundamental to the proper role of Parliament and accountability of ministers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we look forward to the Prime Minister's statement tomorrow on the integrated review, yet over the last week there have been a series of detailed media briefings about decisions in that integrated review. And with the Defence Secretary in his place, can you offer guidance to the House, Mr. Speaker, ahead of the follow-up command paper on Monday and the Defence Industrial Strategy on Tuesday, so that we do not have the same serious disregard of the Ministerial Code and disrespect of Parliament. Further to that point, forward. Okay. We have indeed seen a steady drumbeat of media stories promoting radical changes to our defence posture, but the Defence Select Committee also has not received any of these briefings, despite frequent requests from the Department. What troubles me the most, Mr Speaker, is the MOD's decision to share with the media uh, the desire to increase our nuclear stockpile with the purchase of 200 W93 US-made warheads. I'm a firm supporter of CAS-D, Mr Speaker, but changes to our non-proliferation policy deserve proper oversight in this House and not used as a sweetener to overshadow dramatic cuts to our conventional defence posture. Could I ask for your guidance on how we can encourage the MOD to brief the Defence Select Committee, perhaps in Lady Bird Book form, as the Defence Secretary likes to promote, and also to make sure that any announcements on CASD are made in this chamber first. Right. Can I say I'm grateful to both right honourable gentlemen for giving me notice of the points of order. Erskine May states that the Speaker has made it clear that media should not be informed about the content of statements before they've been made to this House. When a statement is made, members will of course have an opportunity to ask about any advance briefing given to the media. But my position is clear. I want important policy announcements to be made first to this House. Ministers on the Treasury bench will have heard the Right Honourable Gentleman's comments and response, and the same with the Chair of the Select Committee. I expect that response will be shared with all Ministers, and they will act accordingly. Thank you. I am now going to suspend the House for three minutes to enable the necessary arrangements to be made. Order. Order. 
Before we come to the statement by the Home Secretary, I need to inform the House that because of charges have now been brought in the Sarah Everhard case, legal proceedings are now active for the purposes of the House sub judice resolution. That means that reference should not be made to the case, including any details of those against whom charges have been brought. It is, however, in order to discuss, for example, the relationship between the COVID-19 regulations and the right to protest. I now call the Home Secretary. Priti Patel. Yeah. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on the tragic death of Sarah Everard and the events of Saturday evening. I would like to begin by saying that my thoughts and prayers are with Sarah's family and friends at this unbearable time. And I know that every member of this House will join me in offering her loved ones our deepest sympathies. While this is a horrific case, which has rightly prompted debate and questions around wider issues, we must remember that a young woman has lost her life and that a family is grieving. Mr Speaker, let me turn to this weekend's events. I have already said that some of the footage circulating online of Clapham Common is upsetting. So whilst the police are rightly operationally independent, I asked the Metropolitan Police for a report into what had happened. This government backs our police in fighting crime and keeping the public safe, but in the interest of providing greater assurance and ensuring public confidence, I have asked Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary to conduct a full independent lessons learned review. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner has welcomed this, and I will await the report and, of course, update the House in due course. Mr Speaker, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge why Sarah's death has upset so many. My heartache and that of others can be summed up in just five words. She was just walking home. And while the specific circumstances of Sarah's disappearance are thankfully uncommon, what has happened has reminded women everywhere of the steps that we take each day without a second thought to keep ourselves safe. It has rightly ignited anger at the danger posed to women by predatory men, an anger I feel as strongly as anyone. And accounts shared online in the wake of Sarah's disappearance are so powerful because every single one of us can relate to them. Too many of us have walked home from school or work alone, only to hear footsteps uncomfortably close behind us. Too many of us have pretended to be on the phone to a friend to scare someone off. Too many of us have clutched our keys in our fists in case we need to defend ourselves. And that is not okay. Women and girls must feel safe whilst walking our streets. That is why we have continued to take action. Our landmark domestic abuse bill is on track to receive royal assent by the end of April, and this will transform our collective response to this abhorrent crime. This builds on other measures we have brought forward, including the controlling or coercive behaviour offence and the domestic violence disclosure scheme, known as Clare's Law, which enables individuals to ask the police whether their partner has a violent or abusive past. We have also introduced new preventative tools and powers to tackle crimes including stalking, female genital mutilation and so-called upskirting. But we can never be complacent. Which is why throughout the passage of the Domestic Abuse Bill, we have accepted amendments from honourable members from political parties across this House. The bill now includes new offences of non-fatal strangulation, it outlaws threats to disclose intimate images, and extends the controlling or coercive behaviour offence to cover post-separation abuse. This is in addition to the bill's existing measures, which include a new statutory definition of domestic abuse that recognises the many forms abuse can take. That's psychological, physical, emotional, economic, sexual, and of course the impact of abuse on children, as well as the new rules to prevent victims having to go through the pain of being cross-examined by their abusers in family and in civil courts. We all know action is needed to improve the outcomes for rape cases, and we are currently developing robust actions as part of our end-to-end -end review of rape to reverse the declining outcomes in recent years. 
And Mr Speaker, at the end of last year in December, I launched the first ever public survey of women and girls to hear their views on how we can better tackle these gendered crimes. On Friday, in the wake of the outpouring of grief, I reopened that survey. I can tell the House that as of 11am today, the Home Office has received 78,000 responses since 6pm on Friday. That is completely unprecedented and considerably more than the 18,000 responses received over the entire 10-week period when the survey was previously open. I'm listening to women and girls up and down the country, and their views will help to shape a new strategy on tackling violence against women and girls, which I will bring forward to this House later this year. The Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill, which we will, Mr Speaker, shortly be debating, will end the halfway release of those convicted for sexual offences such as rape. Instead, under our law, vile criminals responsible for these terrible crimes will spend at least two-thirds of their time behind bars. Our new law will extend the scope of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 with regards to the abuse of positions of trust, something which predominantly affects young girls. And it will introduce case law, which will encourage the police to impose pre-charge bail with appropriate conditions where necessary and proportionate to do so, which we hope will, will provide reassurance and additional protection for alleged victims in high-harm cases like domestic abuse. I note the opposition will today be voting against these crucial measures, against measures to support victims of violent crimes, including young women and girls. Finally, Mr Speaker, the Government is providing an extra £40 million to help victims during the pandemic and beyond. And last month, we launched a new Government advertising campaign, hashtag It Still Matters, to raise awareness of sexual violence services and ensure victims know where to get help. Mr Speaker, I want to end by saying that over the past year, during the coronavirus pandemic, the police have been faced with an, an enviable and immediately difficult task. It is one, for most part, that they have approached with skill and professionalism, helping to enforce regulations as determined by Parliament with one crucial objective in mind, to save lives. This House approved those changes by 524 votes to 16 on the 6th of January this year. Sadly, as of Sunday the 14th of March, more than 125,500 lives have been lost to this horrible virus. It is for that reason that I continue to urge everyone, for as long as these regulations are in place, not to participate in large gatherings or attend protests. The right to protest is the cornerstone of our democracy. But the government's duty remains to prevent more lives being lost during this pandemic. Finally, Mr Speaker, there will undoubtedly be more discussions of these vitally important issues in the days and weeks to come. But we cannot forget and must not forget that a family is grieving. And I know the thoughts and prayers of this whole house are with Sarah's loved ones at this truly terrible time. We now come to Shadow Home Secretary Nick Thomas Simmons. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Home Secretary for coming to the House today to make a statement for advance sight of it. We come together at a time of national grief and what must now be a time of change. The news of Sarah Everard's death is heartbreaking for us all, and our thoughts are with her family and friends. And whilst I of course appreciate the legal sensitivity of the case, reports around its circumstances are extremely distressing. The reaction to Sarah Everard's death across the country has been extraordinarily powerful and moving, led by the passionate voices of women and girls who are rightly demanding action and change. And it cannot be right that so many women continue to fear for their safety on a daily basis, whether on the streets or at home. The testimonies that have been shared highlight the unacceptable levels of abuse and misogyny harassment on the streets, walking home with headphones turned off to listen for threats, keys between fingers, being told to stay home after dark to avoid attackers. But let me be clear, it is not women who should change their behaviour, it is men and wider society that needs to change. 
And at times like this, it is vital people are able to have their voices heard, of course in a way that is lawful and COVID secure. Yet this weekend in Clapham, things clearly went very wrong. And I share the anger about the policing and the scenes we saw. It's right that the Mayor of London has shown leadership by calling on Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and the Independent Office for Police Conduct to investigate. The Home Secretary asked for a report from the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, and I hope she will publish it because transparency is so important. Can the Home Secretary also publish the minutes of the advance meeting that were held on Friday, mentioned by the Policing Minister on the media this morning? And can she confirm what communication she personally had with the Metropolitan Police prior to the events on Saturday. And whilst the event was a vigil, not a protest, the scenes from Clapham should be a red warning light to the government that ministers should not be rushing through laws, cracking down on protest. The truth is, Mr Speaker, this government is failing to address violence against women and girls, and ministers even want to curtail their right to protest about it. It is a chronic failure from this government. And meetings and reopening surveys alone are nowhere near enough. And meetings, we understand, that the Women and Equalities Minister won't even be attending this evening. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that recorded rapes doubled between 2014 and 2019. Doubled. The Crime Survey for England and Wales showed that over 2 million people experienced domestic abuse in a year yet only a tiny fraction are charged, and charging rates are falling. The justice system sends a perverse message that murdering someone at home, which predominantly means men killing women, is a lesser crime than killing someone in the street by handing out shorter sentences for domestic homicides. The 296-page bill we will consider later today contains the word memorial eight times and fails to include the word women once. The government's message is they want to lock up people who damage the statues of slave traders for 10 years when rape sentences start at half that. And I say to the government today, unless this changes, unless there's action on homicide, unless there's action on street harassment, unless there's action on stalking, this bill will risk becoming an abuser's charter that just allows violence and injustice in our streets and in our homes to continue unchecked. Ministers have been on the airwaves today, struggling to find aspects of the bill that will make a difference to addressing violence against women and girls. And let me just take one example. Ministers have pointed to whole life tariffs for rape. Now, I would ask the, the Home Secretary, when she gets to her feet, to answer how many rape convictions have resulted in life terms, because the answer is hardly any. Today, the High Court ruled in favour of the status quo on rape, and it is a status quo that is shameful, and the government must change. The figures show that 99%, 99% of rapes reported to the police in England and Wales result in no legal proceedings whatsoever. 99%. It's effectively a get-out-of-jail-free card, and it is appalling. It doesn't have to be this way. This could be a time of national unity when we decide to come together as a country to put forward protections. The government can either change course, take necessary action, or ministers will find themselves on the wrong side of history once again. Yeah. Secretary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the Honourable Gentleman for his comments, but if I may, Mr Speaker, at a time when the country is mourning a, in significant, a significant loss and there, there are moments of great unity, I'm quite sorry to hear the tone of the Honourable Gentleman, particularly in terms of the government's record when it comes to and our commitment of tackling violence against women and girls. And the Right Honourable Gentleman will also be well cited, more than aware, of the significant contributions of all members of this House to the Domestic Abuse Bill, which has been under debate, scrutiny, challenge, amendment for a considerable period of time, in fact. 
and it is in the House of Lords, the other place right now. But I would like to emphasise, Mr Speaker, that this government is committed when it comes to violence against women and girls at the highest level. And when you look at, in fact, the work of this government over the last decade, and if I may, Mr Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, for all her work in particular, because she was the one that really set the bar high in legislation um, from all the measures, not just in terms of the DA bill, but FGM, violence against women and girls, um, everything that has been put forward in terms of money, support for charities, this government is building upon that, and no one can ignore that simple fact. The Right Honourable Gentleman has also made some specific references to the bill that will be debated this afternoon, um, in particular as well to rape and rape convictions. The bill is a criminal, um, criminal justice bill, as well as a policing bill, and he will also be very mindful of the work that this government is undertaking right now with regards to the end-to-end -end rape review to completely reverse the declining outcomes that we have seen in recent years. This government is increasingly and very honest up front about the declining outcomes that we have seen. We are working with all the relevant parties, including the CPS. We want to change the way of direction there. And there is much more work to come, and that will be published in due course, shortly in fact. But to say that the bill itself does nothing for women is completely wrong, primarily when it comes to sentencing, because it will end the halfway release of those convicted for sexual offences such as rape. Instead, our laws will go after those vile criminals, and they will spend at least two-thirds of their times behind bars. And, Mr Speaker, I think it's worth reflecting that it was in 2003, under a Labour government, that made automatic halfway release mandatory for all standard determinant sentences, regardless of whether the offender had been convicted of a violent or sexual offence. And the bill discussion that will be debated later on will reverse that policy. The Honourable Gentleman, the Right Honourable Gentleman, also says that there's no mention of women in the bill specifically. That's another accusation that I will reject, primarily because it's a criminal law and sentencing bill which applies equally to everybody. And the party opposite will also know that in line with the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act bill in 2005, the Criminal Justice Act in 2003, neither of those bills which related to criminal justice and sentencing mentioned women as well. Now, of course, there are many other measures that we will discuss through the passage later on of this bill. But I do, Mr Speaker, want to come back to the statement, the points that I have made in particular. Um, it is right when it comes to um, the Metropolitan Police. Um, I have had many discussions with them on Friday, over the weekend, with the Commissioner specifically, um, in relation to preparations and planning prior to Saturday evening. Um, my comments are public, they're on the record in terms of what has happened, and quite frankly, the upsetting images that were um, out on Saturday evening. We have a review that's now being conducted by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Contemporary. It is right that takes place. I also think, Mr Speaker, no one should prejudge anything in terms of you know, conduct um, until we absolutely see what has happened in terms of that report. The police are rightly operationally independent. But I do just want to conclude by saying that, of course, all of us in this House, this isn't just about the government, all of us want to work to drive the right outcome so that women feel safe. Laws and legislation will absolutely do that. There's no question about that. But there is something also about behaviour and culture. That's culture across society. That's culture with men as well. And we should be upfront about that, never shy away from being honest and discussing that. But right now, I think this House should all have in their thoughts and in their prayer Sarah's families and friends at this particularly unbearable time. Well so to right on what's reason. Well thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for her remarks. And she is right to remind us that behind the events of Saturday lies the tragic death of Sarah Everard, a bright young woman dearly loved by her family and friends. And I join my right honourable friend and other members of this House in saying that my thoughts and prayers are with Sarah's family and friends at this time. We want justice for Sarah. We also want women to be able to feel and be safe on our streets and in their homes. So does my right honourable friend agree that we must redouble our efforts to make sure that the government's excellent domestic abuse bill reaches the statute book as anticipated next month, but also recognise that legislation is not enough and that if we are going to eradicate 
violence against women and girls. We need a change of attitudes. And that is about dealing with perpetrators, changing their behaviour, but also teaching young men and boys about respect for women and about what is or is not acceptable in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would just like to very much pay tribute to my right honourable friend for her comments and her work and leadership. No question um, around domestic abuse, but violence against women and girls. And she's absolutely right in terms of the fact that The Domestic Abuse Bill is a landmark bill. It is a landmark piece of legislation that I think actually all honourable members of this House should feel proud of in the work that has come together across across this House. Um, But also, my right honourable friend is absolutely right in terms of the cultural and behavioural aspects that must be changed. And, you know, for all all of us, um, have to be conscious of that. You know, as, as a mother bringing up a young son... Um, absolutely respecting women and girls and treating everyone fairly and rightly with equality and understanding that there, there are no barriers and demonstrating that respect to one another and importantly tolerance to one another as well is absolutely vital. There is so much more work to do. Legislation can only go so far. We can never, ever be complacent, but with that as well, as a government and I think this Parliament, this House, across both Houses, will absolutely share the determination and the desire to do so much more when it comes to protecting girls and women, but also in our strategies where we must all be united. This isn't about just saying, you know, um, there's a survey taking place. We must all contribute to that. And in fact, now the survey has been reopened, I very much hope that members of the party opposite will actually contribute to that to help us have a united and coherent approach, one voice approach, in fact, to how we can support and prevent, um, support women and girls, but prevent violence against women and girls too. Let's go to SNP spokesperson Angela Crawley. Angela. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The murder of Sarah Everard has truly shocked and saddened us all. Can I join the other others in sending our heartfelt condolences to Sarah's family and friends at this time? She was walking home, a sentence that resonates with all women. This tragedy serves as a stark reminder to women who assess every aspect of their daily lives in fear of sexual violence, assault or abhorrent crimes inflicted at the hands of men. Can I once more take this opportunity to urge the PM to ratify the Istanbul Convention without further delay? Across the UK this weekend, women reclaimed the streets in protest and to pay tribute to the life of Sarah Everard. Police responding have received widespread criticism and the questions must be answered. A 